This lecture will cover Enterobius vermicularis, which is also called the pinworm or threadworm. I'm Dr. Paul Pottinger. So my objectives for this lecture are for you to understand the fundamentals of the Enterobius life cycle so that as a medical doctor you can intervene on behalf of your patients and break the life cycle. You should appreciate the epidemiology of this worm and make a diagnosis based on the way it presents clinically and based on the simple testing that you should know how to do. And become familiar with treatment options. So here's our tree of life and pathogens in the course. We're at the top of the nematode or roundworm section. There's Enterobius. And I would emphasize Enterobius is the simplest of what we call the GI nematodes. They're also called soil transmitted helminths or geohelminths for reasons that'll become clear as we go through these worms one by one. This is the life cycle of Enterobius. It starts when this person eats food uh, that is contaminated with eggs or has eggs contaminating uh, the skin of the fingers or under the fingernails. The eggs we're talking about are microscopically small. They have this very pleasant dome shape, flat on one side, round on the other. There's nothing else in medicine that looks quite like this. They're important because even though they're microscopically small, when they are consumed, they make their way down the esophagus and into the stomach. In the stomach, the digestive juices allow the eggs to hatch, and out of each egg comes one tiny larval worm. The worms mature on their magical journey down into the cecum, and when they reach the cecum, they have reached adulthood, meaning sexual maturity. There, boy meets girl, they have sex. That makes the human the definitive host, using the terminology for this infection. And once they have sex, uh, the female has been fertilized. She will then make her way down to the rectum and eventually, usually at nighttime, actually crawl out through the rectal aperture, through the anus, and lay eggs in a very sticky goo along the perianal skin. Now, they're microscopically small. You can't see them, but that goo is irritating. And that means that people tend to scratch. And when people scratch, it's very common that they will auto-infect themselves by transferring those sticky eggs up to their mouth when they scratch with their fingernails and then suck their thumb, for example. However, you can also get this from other people because the eggs can remain uh, viable for months at a time. People share underwear, share towels without doing proper hygiene, even just being in the same bed. This can be spread from person to person. This is what the adults look like. This is larger than life size. They do look a little bit like a pin or a thread, and that's where the name comes from, only a millimeter long. So the transmission is fecal oral from one person's butt to that person or another person's mouth. I'd emphasize this is an infection of people. We call that an anthroponosis. There's no known animal reservoir or other host for this infection. I would also emphasize the parasite has to leave the body in order to complete its life cycle. Those eggs will not mature and hatch inside of one person. It's important for breaking the cycle. So the epidemiology, this infection has been around literally for thousands of years. This is a picture of a coprolite, a fossilized piece of human poop, and those coprolites uh, going back for many thousands of years actually have the eggs of anaerobius in them. Even to this day, it's a cosmopolitan infection, meaning it happens any place where the people are, anywhere on planet Earth, not just the tropics, but temperate climates and definitely the United States. Hundreds of millions of infections worldwide. You don't have to be poor or disadvantaged to have this infection, although it does tend to impact children and it tends to impact the caregivers of those children more than others. How does it present? Most people with anaerobias have no symptoms whatsoever. These worms have evolved to be very well tolerated, and so most people won't even know they have this if it's a light infection. But with heavy infections, it usually shows up with an itchy butt. The Latin term for itchy butt is pruritus ani. And itchy butt is what makes people scratch and then either suck their thumb or transfer it hand to hand to another person. In young children, it can also show up in odd ways. These kids may become irritable. They may start to wet the bed where they didn't before. They may not sleep quite right. And of course, if they're young enough and pre-verbal, they can't explain what's really going on. When the parent makes an exam of their kid, they may find that there is a rash of the perianal skin. That rash could just be due to the eggs themselves, but it's also true that kids may get a secondary or super infection 
uh, not because it's a super infection, but because it's superimposed on the original process. And that can, in other words, be a staph or a strep infection of the skin where they're scratching. Sometimes the adult female worms will make their way uh, not back into the rectum, but into the vagina, and they can be housed there too. And of course, that'll lead to a vaginal discharge syndrome. You will see case reports in the literature of patients who have appendicitis caused by these worms. This is a cross-section of a patient's appendix after it came out for appendectomy and on the microscope cross sections of worms. This appendix was full of pinworms. Whether that was the cause of the appendicitis or whether they were just there as innocent bystanders is simply impossible to know. What's the immune response to these pinworms? There is no immune response, folks. They do not invade your tissue. They never really show themselves to uh, the gut associated lymphatic tissue or GALT. No, they dwell in the lumen of your GI very unusual for patients to mount an eosinophilic IgE mediated response and that's important because it means we'll probably never have an effective vaccine for this infection. So how do you make a diagnosis? People come into you and they say they have an itchy butt so you'll have a clinical suspicion. When you hear itchy butt think pinworm but then confirm your suspicion. Find those eggs. Uh, what we prefer is to have the patient come to clinic hot and sticky. Do not take a bath. Don't take a shower before they come to see you. Just have them come in early in the morning if possible. Uh, drop their drawers. You should please wear gloves, of course, and then take a peach of scotch tape or cellophane tape, press it uh, up against the perianal skin, and send that off to the lab. Uh, you can also scrape under the fingernails if people have grungy looking fingernails. That's important because when we look either for the perianal skin prep or under the fingernails, if you see the eggs, you've made your diagnosis. There's nothing else to do but go ahead and treat that patient. The eggs are not passed consistently. And in theory, if you fail to make the diagnosis on the first time, you may have to repeat this procedure up to six times. That's extremely unpopular for everybody, doctor and patient. Sometimes you end up just treating them on your best hunch empirically. Also, by the way, sometimes parents will go in at night, look with a flashlight at their kids, and they'll see the adults squirming out of the peri anal area. That's unusual, but if parents tell you they've seen this, they're probably to be trusted. And then finally, what to do for treatment? Well, first of all, you should kill the worms. And we use one of two different medicines in the USA, either albendazole or parentel. They're both effective. Albendazole is absorbed from the GI tract and goes through your system in the bloodstream. Parentel stays in the gut. That's why I prefer parentel because these worms don't go into your system. They just stay in the gut. But both of them are highly effective. But you have to break the cycle, right? So breaking the cycle involves enhanced personal hygiene, minimizing the amount of scratching, keeping those fingernails trim. If a kid is a thumb sucker, this is an excuse to get them to stop. Generally improving your hand and personal hygiene. So those are the key concepts for Enerobius vermicularis. It's also called the pinworm or the threadworm. It's a roundworm, aka nematode. The adults are one or two millimeters long, the eggs are flat on one side, and it's spread by fecal oral transmission. You can get this infection any place on planet Earth, but especially kids, auto-infection and reinfection uh, of groups, especially kids to parents, are common. Usually shows up with an itchy butt if it shows up with anything at all. You're going to make that diagnosis with a perirectal cellophane tape test, and we treat with either albendazole or parentel. Prevention involves cleaning up your act. Thanks for your attention.